John Bunyan's Group of Thoughts, Part 1 One day, a man comes walking in the wilderness. The man seems to be full of sorrow. He breaks into loud cries again and again. He looks down at his ragged clothes and shakes his head sadly. Oh, why is the man so sad? The man has his face turned away from his own house. It stands behind him and inside are his wife and children. The man knows they cannot help him with this sorrow. He cries again. What shall I do? What shall I do? Trembling and weeping, the man stands there, seemingly helpless and confused. There's something wrong. And this man doesn't know what to do or how to find help. The man is holding a book in his hand. It is an important book, the most important book in the world. It is God's word, the Bible. Why does the man cry as he reads the Bible? Is the Bible bad news? The Bible contains good news. It tells people what God himself says about his wonderful love for all people. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So why is the man crying? The man is crying because he doesn't know about God's love. He is afraid of God. He knows that God is just and holy and that he is a sinner in God's sight. The man's body appears to be odd-shaped. That is because a large heavy load is strapped to his back. This great burden weighs him down and slows his step. It drains his strength and spoils his pleasure. The burden is heavy, but the man cannot shift it. It is always there, a part of his daily life. Perhaps the man cannot even imagine what life would be like without this heavy burden. Breaking into another spell of weeping and trembling, the man finally turns toward his house. What shall I do? He mutters as he heads for home. Arriving home, the man tried to hide his troubles from his wife and family. But he failed. The more he struggled to keep quiet, the more troubled he felt inside. Finally, the words burst out. Oh, my dear wife, and you, my dear children, Pilgrim sobbed. Of course, his wife and children were amazed to see him cry. They couldn't understand what might be wrong. They had never seen Pilgrim behave this way before. I have a heavy burden which presses hard upon me, the crying man went on. Mother looked at the oldest son and raised her eyebrows. The children shrugged their shoulders and shook their heads. A burden? What was Pilgrim talking about? I have learned that our city will be burned with fire from heaven, Pilgrim told his family. Everyone and everything will be destroyed. He groaned in sorrow. All the people, all the buildings, destroyed. In this fearful overthrow, both myself, with you my wife, and you my sweet babes, shall miserably come to ruin unless some way of escape can be found. I cannot see a way of escape for any of us. The unhappy pilgrim's words gave way to a fresh wail of sorrow. He was crushed with sadness, not only for himself but also for his wife and dear children whom he loved. At first his family thought that pilgrim must have taken ill, maybe had a fever which mixed up his thinking. To them, his behavior seemed crazy. They simply could not understand what had gone wrong. Mrs. Pilgrim took charge. It's close to evening. Let's get him off to bed. Maybe a good sleep will settle his brains. The children helped mother prepare Pilgrim for bed. Everybody worked quickly. They didn't like to see their father in such sorrow. But the night was as troubled to Pilgrim as the day had been. Instead of sleeping, he lay awake through all the dark hours, sighing and crying. In the morning, the family wanted to know how Pilgrim felt. When they asked, he told them, worse and worse. What were they to do now? They had to find a way to change Pilgrim's strange behavior, to heal his madness. Pilgrim's wife and children began to treat him very harshly. They spoke in a nasty way and didn't show him any kindness at all. Maybe they hoped this would shock him back into his normal thinking. When he still didn't change, his wife and children mocked Pilgrim, scolded him, sometimes ignored him completely for long periods of time. It must have been very difficult for Pilgrim to handle his family's treatment. But he was so convinced of the truth about God's coming judgment on the city he couldn't pretend that it didn't matter. So he spent many hours alone in his room praying to God and asking God for help and guidance. It seemed no human being could help him, maybe God would. During these many times of prayer, Pilgrim also asked God to bless and help his wife and children, 
even though they weren't very nice to him. He also asked God for comfort in his own troubles. Pilgrim also went out for walks often. In the open field he was away from his family's insults and jeers. No matter where he walked, one thing was on his mind. God's judgment was coming. He and his family would perish. As he walked across those rough, plowed fields or through the thick bushes, Pilgrim had his Bible before his face. It may have been pretty countryside, but Pilgrim didn't notice. He spent the time reading God's word, looking for help in his trouble. Even when he wasn't reading, Pilgrim hardly saw the beauty of nature around him. Often, his eyes were closed in prayer as he talked to God and told him, again and again, of his fears. One day, in the field, while reading his book, Pilgrim cries out, What must I do to be saved? He looked this way and that way, like a man ready to run. Yet he stood still, he could not tell which way to go. A man called Evangelist appeared. What's wrong? He asked the troubled pilgrim. Sir, the weeping pilgrim replies, I see by this book I am condemned to die and after that to come to judgment. I am not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. Why not willing to die, since life has so many troubles? Evangelist asked. Pilgrim answered by pointing to the burden on his back. I am afraid this burden will sink me lower than the grave into the place of burning. Evangelist, if this is your condition, why are you standing there? Pilgrim, because I don't know where to go. Then Evangelist gave Pilgrim a parchment with God's words written on it. The words were, Flee from the wrath to come. Matthew 3, 7. Pilgrim read the strong words of warning. He gazed at Evangelist, then looked at the words again. A deep question formed in his mind. He had to ask this stranger who seemed to be the only one interested in his problem. Where must I flee? That's what flee from the wrath to come. Matthew 3, 7. Pilgrim wanted to know. But, could this stranger tell him? Could Evangelist help Pilgrim? Evangelist, do you see yonder wooden gate? Pilgrim, no. Evangelist, do you see yonder shining light? Pilgrim, I think I do. Evangelist. Keep your eye on that light and go directly to it. When you knock, you will be told what to do. Now Pilgrim had to choose. Run, or not? What would Pilgrim do? What would you have done? Don't forget, the light and the woodland gate lie across the field and away from Pilgrim's house. If he obeyed Evangelist he would be running away from something as well as running to something. You think Pilgrim ran? Yes? You are right. Now Pilgrim had not run far from his own door when his wife and children saw him. What is that man doing now? They must have wondered. They all began to shout after him. Stop! Come back. But Pilgrim put his fingers in his ears and ran on, crying. Life. Life. Eternal life. He didn't even look back, but ran on into the middle of the field. The neighbors also came out to see Pilgrim run. Some of them mocked him, some threatened, some called after him to return. Among them were two men who had decided to bring him back by force. The men's names were obstinate and playable. When they overtook him, Pilgrim asked them, Neighbors, why did you come? To persuade you to go back with us, one of the men replied. Pilgrim, that cannot be, by any means. You dwell in the city of destruction. Sooner or later you will die there and sink lower than the grave into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Be content, good neighbors, and go along with me. What? Obstinate answered. And leave all our friends and comforts behind us? Yes, said Pilgrim. That all you speak about is not worthy to be compared with a little of what I expect to enjoy. If you will go along with me, Pilgrim went on, you will receive everything I receive. For, where I go, there is enough for everybody and lots to spare. Come away and prove my words. What are you looking for, obstinate asked, since you leave all the world to find it? I seek heaven's inheritance which will last forever, Pilgrim said. At God's set time it will be given to those who diligently seek it. Read it, if you will, in my book. Obstinate turned towards home. Away with your book, he muttered. Will you go back with us or not? No, said Pilgrim. I have laid my hand to the plow. I will not look back. Obstinate, come then, neighbor pliable. Let us turn again and go home without him. Pliable, if what the good pilgrim says is true, 
The things he looks for are better than ours. My heart inclines to go with my neighbor. Obstinate, what, more fools still? Be ruled by me and go back. Who knows where such a brainsick fellow will lead you? Go back, go back and be wise. Pilgrim, come with me, neighbor pliable. There are many more glories besides. If you don't believe me, read here in this book. Pliable, well, neighbor obstinate. I intend to go along with this good man. Obstinate, and I will go back to my place. I will be no companion of such misled, fanatical fools. Come then, good neighbor, pilgrim invited pliable. Let us be going. As they went, the two men talked. My friend, pliable asked, do you know the way to this desired place? Pilgrim told Pliable about Evangelist. Evangelist directed me to speed to yonder little gate before us, Pilgrim said. There we shall receive more direction about the way. Together, the men walked steadily towards the gate, talking as they went. Neighbor Pliable, I am glad you are persuaded to go along with me, Pilgrim encouraged his friend. If Obstinate had felt the powers and terrors I have felt, he would not have turned back. Neighbor Pilgrim Pliable said, tell me more about what these great things are, and how we will enjoy them, and where we are going. Pliable seemed full of questions. Pilgrim found it hard to explain. I can picture them better in my mind than explain them in words, Pilgrim answered. But, since you are so eager to know, I will read of them in my book. Are you sure the words of your book are true? Pliable asked. Yes. Pilgrim replied. Absolutely certain? Because this book comes from God, who cannot lie. Good, Pliable said. Now, what things are spoken of in the book? There is an endless kingdom for us to live in, and a gift of everlasting life for all who live there, Pilgrim told Pliable. How wonderful, Pliable said. What else is there? There are crowns of glory to be given us, and garments that will make us shine like the very sun that lights the sky. This is excellent. What else? Asked Pliable. There shall be no more crying, no sorrow. For he that is owner of the place will wipe all tears from our eyes, Pilgrim read to Pliable. He read this from a number of different places in God's book. How pleasant it must have been for the two pilgrims to cheer each other by remembering the promises from God's word. Pliable soon thought of more questions to ask. What company shall we have there? He wanted to know. Pilgrim, there. We shall be with seraphim and cherubim, creatures that will dazzle our eyes to look on them. Seraphim and cherubim are two kinds of heavenly beings, angels who serve God before his throne. There also we shall meet with thousands and ten thousands that have gone before us to that place. None of them are hurtful, but loving and holy, everyone walking in the sight of God and living in his presence. Pilgrim went on. To be continued.